Medical assistance in dying is a topic of intense debate in North America, and one which can involve psychiatrists in a number of ways. From assessing competence in decision-making to deciding eligibility for people with mental illnesses. To discuss this more, I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Rebecca Brendel and Dr. Maria Okendo. Thanks very much for joining me today. Thank you. And thank you very much for giving up your time for this interview. So let's kick off. Uh, who can access medical assistance in dying in the US and Canada? And what are the eligibility criteria? Well, in the United States, uh, there is a growing minority of states that allow for medical aid in dying although some states, including Oregon, don't have a residency requirement. So technically, anyone in the U.S. could travel there to access this. And it's generally in the U.S. available to people who are terminally ill and have a diagnosis of a terminal illness and who have consulted several times with a physician about a request to get help with dying. Similarly, in Canada, you have to have a terminal illness. And it also is the case that you have to be a resident of Canada and eligible for their national health insurance. In addition, you have to have capacity to consent and you have to have given permission in writing and verbally, but there must be a 15-day waiting period between the first and the second request. What role do psychiatrists play? Well, psychiatrists play a number of critical roles. Uh, for, first of all, in the United States and for now in Canada, people cannot access uh, medical aid in dying for a psychiatric illness. And psychiatrists need to be sure that the desire to die is not the result of a mental illness, such as depression. The second thing that psychiatrists generally do are they're often asked to assess whether individuals have the ability or decisional capacity to choose uh, to opt for medical aid in dying as opposed to going along with treatment for the course of their illness. To add to that, I think that uh, a critical thing is that even though psychiatric illness cannot be the sole underlying medical condition, it is the case, research has shown, that individuals who request medical aid in dying, 40 to 60 percent of the time, do have a psychiatric condition. So the percentage is not trivial. I know in Canada they were looking at making medical aid in, in dying available for psychiatric illnesses, I believe, and, and have put that decision off. What are some of the ethical considerations when making that decision? So I'd say that, number one, the issue around capacity and the impact of psychiatric illness on individuals' perception of reality, even in a condition like major depression, which often is accompanied by a nihilistic, hopeless um, right. type of feeling, that can very much cloud the individual's perspective about whether their life is worth living or not. And of course, a symptom of major depression is suicidal ideation. Right. So making the distinction between a reasonable, reasoned, logical request for aid in dying and suicidal thoughts is very tricky. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. And. You know, it's one of the things as psychiatrists that we experience every day, day in and day out, is really the extraordinary clinical and legal authority to intervene to prevent people from ending their lives as a result of mental illness. So when it comes to having to distinguish from that mindset and that default position, which is a good one, right? So suicide is perhaps the worst outcome of uh, mental illness. We also have to shift the paradigms in which we think about and distinguish desires to end, uh, to end life. Another aspect that certainly take, takes my breath away is as physicians, we have a duty to preserve life, but we also have a duty to alleviate suffering. Right. So how do you make a determination about which one of those is more important? And in fact, some ethicists argue that you actually do more good if you are helping someone end suffering right. who doesn't have a terminal illness because you're preventing more suffering than in someone who has a terminal illness and they are likely to die within the next few months. Well, how do you deal with that ethical consideration? Well, I think the Canadian example is a good one. You take your time and you really think it through and you come up with ways to translate between the conflict and values and the different values considerations and policies that are clear in the implementation. And I, I would suggest err on the side of life because states and physicians have obligations to preserve life as a default 
On the other hand, we have to really understand that there's a diversity of experiences of life and of suffering that we need to take seriously. And to say that people suffer more with physical illness than mental illness also fails to recognize how devastating uh, mental illness can be over the course of a life and in terms of suffering. Well, thank you both very much indeed for joining us this morning. We really appreciate it and so much to consider there. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us.